Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, if you haven't already, grab some food, grab water. If you need um, assistance of where the bathrooms are, just tag one of us. Um, and we will mention it again, but we have some of these wonderful books for sale. So please, um, you know, pick up a copy for yourself or someone maybe for a gift. But my name is Anna Wyke. I'm the program administrator for the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program. Uh, we are thrilled to host this book event today. We are super happy and I think you guys are gonna love this talk. Um, so another quick note is just that this event is being recorded. So please note that, that by sitting in here, you're consenting to being recorded. Um, so today we have with us the wonderful HLS alum, Andrew Leon Hanna. And he is the author, of course, of the book that we are gonna be discussing today, 25 Million Sparks, The Untold Story of Refugee Entrepreneurs with Cambridge University Press. Won lots of awards, you can see. It's um, getting a lot of buzz as a book, so we're lucky to have him here. He is also the founder of three social ventures supporting and investing in underrepresented entrepreneurs, DreamX America, Mona, and Sawa. Of course, he graduated from HLS. He also graduated from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Duke University. Alongside him, we have in conversation Viet Nguyen, who's a student with HKS, and he's also the founder and executive director of Ed Mobilizer, through which he has led nationwide movements to eliminate college application fees for first gen and low income applicants. He's also had centers, launched centers for low socioeconomic status students and more. He graduated as well from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Brown University. So please join me in giving it up for these two wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming out today. Um, thank you, Andrew, for coming in. I, I still remember when you, know, you were writing this book our first year of business school and seeing the impact and progress it's made um, in changing the narratives around refugees has been so inspiring to watch. Appreciate um, it so much. I think just to give us more context, uh, we would love if you could sort of read an excerpt of your book, um, and then we'll launch into some questions. Definitely, and thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you here. Viet, Anna, thank you so much for everything, and thank you for all the co-sponsors um, who were a part of this. So uh, really glad to be back home, sort of, if law school for three years is a home. <laughs> 1L was not my home time period, but 2L and 3L maybe. Um, so yeah, I'll read a, a, a portion of the book. Um, but I guess just one very brief uh, setting, but not too much. Um, it is, takes place in the Zetri refugee camp in Jordan, uh, and the three primary, kind of the narrative focuses on three uh, Syrian refugee entrepreneurs in the Zetri camp, um, Esma, Melek, and Yasmina, and the first chapter sort of intros each of them in the middle of kind of their entrepreneurial work. So this will be about Esma. Sitting alone in the center of her trailer on a chocolate-colored cushion resting atop the chocolate-colored carpet, Esma looks down at a children's book. Her soft brown eyes dart across page after page in sheer concentration. It was a quick rehearsal for the performance to come, a rare moment of silence in trailer 6.4, District 8, Zatri. Suddenly, without a word from Esma, the trailer around her is transformed. Children's laughter and stomping against the dirt outside grows louder and louder until the trailer walls shake slightly. The wooden door creaks open. Five young boys take off their shoes and dive into the open space in front of Esma, as is their weekly ritual. Her living room had become a magical escape for them. Ehlen was Ehlen ya Sami. Welcome, Sami. Esma greets each of them, her face having instantaneously switched from focus to a smile. If Yesma's smile is wise and Melek's is eager, Esma's is soft and infectiously joyful. More and more children pour in, and last through the door are two of Esma's favorite students, her eldest daughters, Tamara and Maya. Tamara is shorter, older, and gentler, while Maya is taller, younger, and more playfully mischievous. Returning from Taekwondo practice, they're wearing matching white uniforms with yellow belts. They quickly say their hellos and head to the back room, re-emerging in matching ruby dresses with big ruby bows in their hair. They take turns giving Esma a hug before sitting cross-legged with their friends. It's time to begin. Yalla ya shabab. Come on, children. With three words, as if Esma possesses a supernatural gravitational pull, the children gather to sit in a more organized circle surrounding her. 
She grabs a hold of her baby boy, Muhammad, and puts him firmly in her lap as she, be, as she reaches over, over him to turn to the first page. The magic begins. This story is about a conversation between a boy named Samir and his mom. It is called A Plane That Brings Love. Esma's voice rises and falls as she reads the story with the passion of a once-in-a-lifetime audition. The children concentrate, spellbound by her performance, immersed in a world far removed from the Zatri heat. At each page, Esma smoothly rotates the book towards the kids so they can enjoy the illustrations accompanying the dialogue. Mom, I want to drive an army airplane when I grow up, Samer says. Tamara suddenly stands and scurries to the kitchen. She returns with the water jug and glasses for the group, always a gracious host. Esma continues, but I will be a pilot of love, not of war. I will draw red hearts and spread them everywhere from my plane. I will spread happiness, love, hope, and peace so the little boys and girls can play in peace, so the birds flying around can sing in peace. Upon reaching the final page, she holds up the book to show a cartoon illustration of a boy with brown aviator goggles parachuting down onto the Syrian hills as his mom waits for him with open arms. His parachute is in the form of a red heart with the word love, or hub, labeled on it in three places. Yes, I will be a pilot of love, not war so my country will be more beautiful, a country of hope, happiness, love, and peace. For a second or two, the words hang in the air. Esma closes the book, El Nahaya, the end. In an instant, the spell is lifted. The kids graciously thank Esma and begin to gather their things and leave, playfully pushing one another on their way out. In the moments after their departure, as their laughter fades in the dis distance, Esma is alone again for just a few seconds. She thinks back to when she was a girl two decades ago in the town of Dara and what her education meant to her, how she would sleep in her school uniform because she was so excited for the next day, how she dreamt one day she would become a teacher but worried she lacked the confidence. I loved school, but in class when the teacher would ask a question and I knew the answer, I would have to wait until at least one person raised her hand first. Now she is boldly reinventing herself as a social entrepreneur and poet leading a storytelling initiative that is expanding throughout Zatari. I want every girl to complete her education. Everyone should fulfill her dream. In that brief moment of quiet, Esma looks up and whispers a prayer of thanks for the chance to tashedja, to encourage, to gently uplift children toward the dreams they might otherwise have forgotten. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I, I think 25 million sparks really um, resonated with me, especially given the Vietnamese people's refugee history. Um, for folks in the room who haven't yet read the book, can you give us more of an overview of what the book was about and how you chose this topic? Sure, yeah. So I think um, I'll give you a quick overview on the, the book. Basically, it talks about uh, refugee entrepreneurs around the world. Um, and so. It focuses on this narrative of three Syrian uh, women entrepreneurs in the Zetri camp, as I mentioned. Esma, who you just sort of got to know briefly, Melek, who's an artist, and Yasmina, who runs a wedding dress shop and salon in the camp um, that she had previously run that back in her hometown, also in Dara. Um, Melek is from Damascus. Uh, and they all fled during the early stages of the war in Syria. Uh, and lived in the camp and kind of saw it through um, its extremely difficult early stages and its still difficult stages today, but have brought beauty and life and joy to the camp in a way that is almost hard to believe and is, is some of the most inspiring thing I've ever seen in my life and, and heard about in my life and seen firsthand. Um, and it zooms out from these three kind of you know beautiful and difficult stories uh, and zooms out and talks about the broader refugee entrepreneurship phenomenon around the world. Um, so it talks about the now 30 plus refugees, around, uh, 30 plus million refugees around the world and the fact that they're 1.5 to 2x more entrepreneurial than native born citizens, that they're creating um, not just economic value but spiritual and community value uh, in communities around the world. And ultimately, um, it seeks to make that kind of economic point, but like the, the main hope and purpose of it is to say uh, that refugees are some of the most powerful, creative, mm -hmm innovative and equal human beings on the planet, uh, and that rather than pitying them only or uh, villainizing them, as we've seen a lot of politics and media do, they should be celebrated, welcomed, and invested in. Amazing, yeah, I think that, that's a theme that you've 
uh, come up in your past talks, right? You've mentioned how one of your motivations for writing this book is to shed light on stories of refugees that typically have been ignored by the media, right? Mm -hmm. Not uh, focusing on victimhood, focusing on sort of villain stories, mm -hmm. but focusing on the nuances of the narrative and honoring the dignity of refugees. Mm -hmm. um, in, in writing this book, what misconceptions did you realize you had going in? Mm. How did they change? And what misconceptions do you think people still have about refugees? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, so my parents uh, are immigrants uh, from Egypt, and so that's a lot of why I'm inspired, and, and um, hopefully my Arabic was like decent for the people who, <laughs> who speak Arabic in the room. Um, I'm always criticized and made fun of for that. I, when I met with Esma and, and them, I, I would like attempt to speak Arabic, but Syrian is very different, the dialect. So they would just like nod and think it was cute, and then they'd move on. Um, but, um, but so that's, uh, it's a different experience, obviously, being an immigrant versus a refugee, and for those who aren't aware, it's, the difference is just um, refugees are forced to flee due to whether it be war or violence or disaster um, and uh, persecution based on race or religion or anything else like that. Uh, immigrants are more by choice. And so it's not the, not the same, but um, that's kind of where I, I kind of came about this topic and, and where I started um, focusing. And so at the broader misconception level, um, and then getting to me, I think on the broader misconception level, for me, it was a matter of uh, watching the news mm -hmm. and seeing, uh, as you exactly as you said, a victim or a villain narrative. So to me, it felt like it was either uh, refugees and immigrants more broadly, but in particular refugees are one dimensionally hopeless and need to be looked down upon to pity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all the only images we see are the folks bust, um, you know, to Martha's Vineyard, which was a, a horrible uh, act or we see them crossing the border at their most needy points. And it's important to cover that, of course, but if that's the only message you get, then mm -hmm. you, get to, you tend to think refugees are, you know, they just need a handout. Mm -hmm. And then the more even insidious, perhaps, uh, side of it is refugees are coming to take our jobs, to commit crimes, to uh, do all of this, which is all factually incorrect, which I'm, I'm happy, happy to share more on um, and try to in the book. Um, and so seeing that all in the news, uh, and it continues to be, uh, I think made me kind of do a double take because it's like, all right, my parents are some of the most inspiring people I've ever met. They contributed to my community in Jacksonville. We have a Jacksonville rep here. Um, Duval County, 904. Uh, the Jaguars will be doing really well in the future, so just in case you want to track that. Um, you know, they've contributed in so many ways, uh, and so... Um, you know, as, as a physician, as a, t as a teacher, as a preschool teacher, uh, contributing to thousands of people's lives, saving people's lives in Jacksonville. And so you see this narrative uh, that's completely divorced from what's actually happening. And I know my parents' story is the same as, you know, millions of other refugees and immigrants. Um, my, again, my parents being immigrants, but then refugees in Houston and Minneapolis and in, uh, in my hometown in Jacksonville and here in Cambridge. Um, so. This disconnect uh, is kind of what I wanted to address, and I think most people inherently know it if they interact at all with immigrant or refugee communities, but yet this cloud of politics, I think, creates a, a buzz, like a cloud of buzzwords that confuses people and dehumanizes the whole situation. But then for me personally, I think even for me having cared about this, having had, you know, coming from an immigrant family, um, having worked on this a long time, I think still seeing Esma, Malik, Yasmina, Iman, uh, and so many other people I mentioned in the book in the camp in particular, uh, was r like um, incredibly inspiring. I mean, it, it basically some of the most difficult things a human being can possibly experience, uh, they dealt with. Um, I'm not sure if the passage mentioned it. I sort of zone out when I'm reading, but, <laughs> but with Esma, um, she went through quite a bit. Like her house was burned down early on in her time in Jordan, uh, which is where the camp is. Um, she suffered a miscarriage. Um, she had a period of depression that she talked to me about. Uh, but taking all of that and still being able to, and, and taking a situation at a camp which no human being should live in, uh, she's still able to create a storytelling initiative mm -hmm. that brings dozens and, and hundreds over time of, of people to the camp and inspire them. I think even for me, it was a level of inspiration that is hard to kind of imagine. And it's the same with Melek, who, uh, is a, a friend of mine uh, uh, and um, to, with Yasmina, who, uh, who was able to kind of recreate her shop in the camp in a way that was really amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, no, I, I think this came out in the passage you read, but um, I was really captivated by Esma's ability to tell a story. Um, and the book itself employs 
a lot of unique storytelling tactics. I was wondering if you could talk about your process of telling these stories, how you approach being sensitive as a person from the outside coming in, um, and what you learned from storytellers like Esma in um, changing how you tell stories. Yeah, definitely. It, it was an interesting journey, and I'm happy, I'll be staying afterwards, happy to talk with anyone who's interested in, in writing or has already written or wants to continue writing. Um, so it was a bit of a narrative nonfiction. Uh, it was a narrative nonfiction book with some exposition in every few chapters. And it's, it's an important question that you ask about, you know, basically knowing that I'm coming from the outside and there's no world where I will ever know what it's like to be living in the Zetri camp, to have fled my home uh, in Syria. Um, I, what, what was important to me is what I call like voice-driven narration. So basically, uh, if you're going to amplify the stories and voices of folks from other communities, for me, my perspective um, that I often did not see in narrative nonfiction I studied as I was writing it was to amplify their voices as much as possible. So even like with the book, you'll see it's heavy on quotes, um, yeah. which some writing people will not recommend doing. <laughs> but uh, for me, it was like important to do that. Um, and it's basically the way I wrote the book was I took their quotes, what I call like an oral history of mm. their lives. Uh, and it was heavily like just building around that. Mm. Of course, I like checked it with other people and like there's, it's not just fully um, writing what they say, but it's, it's telling that story from their voices, uh, translating it, shout out to my mom who might be watching on live stream for help, <laughs> helping translate. Uh, and then, um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, basically crafting, filling in the blanks with what I know and what I've seen. Mm. Um, so that was one thing. The other element I was very careful about, um, and hopefully it, it resonated, was um, the camp started out quite dire, and it mm. still is not any, in any way a place that any human being should live. Um, so I wanted to make sure not to say a narrative of these refugee entrepreneurs transformed the camp and now everything is great. Mm. You know, it, it's a combination of uh, the camp is not where someone would live, but the human beings are still some of the most special people and the most amazing people and very equal to everyone else in the world um, and have creative abilities that have transformed the camp during the most difficult situation. And so um, for that, the, the way I like to put that is not to allow the ugliness of the situation confuses from the beauty of the people. Mm. So, um, and unfortunately, I think that's the way that we get confused with the topic of refugees. And when you Google news refugees is, you hear that you, you, you get a, a sad view of the situation, which is, good reporting, it's good to know that, but you forget that the people are human beings just like us, and in fact, some of the most courageous, admirable people. Um, so I wanted to make sure to, mm. to do that balance as well. Um, oh, the other thing is uh, included um, poems from Esma and artwork from Melek. Um, so a bit of like a creative collaboration with them, and um, was able to share the book um, with Melek, for example, um, to make sure that everything kind of was sensitive and appropriate. Um, and yeah. then there's also, sorry, there's also uh, 20 other camps and cities referenced and entrepreneurs from there. So it was interesting working with different people as well. That's awesome. I think throughout the book, you make such a strong case for um, why refugees make incredible entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk more about sort of how you came about that thesis and how as a society we could reduce the barriers to encourage more uh, entrepreneurship and innovation um, to provide opportunity for others. Yeah, definitely. So basically, it, it's it's you have folks who uh, have all of the barriers mm -hmm. to entrepreneurship and yet become some of the most entrepreneurial people. And so it's kind of an interesting thing to just think about. Um, like if you have, uh, you know, I'll count five or so barriers, but I'm not going to get all of them. If you have language barriers, if you have uh, tra a tra traumatic history of having either seen family members die or be separated from family, seeing your house destroyed, um, you have no capital often, um, you know, in, in Yasmina's case, she uh, and her family threw a bunch of trash bags full of uh, their belongings into a truck and, you know, she was pregnant at the time when she left. Um, so very few belongings and capital. Um, she had to sell her wedding jewelry, which was obviously really significant to her, to start the new, the new um, shop. Um, so you have very few ca access to capital and then you, very, very limited capital and very limited access to capital because mm -hmm. Um, refugees coming to different countries in our world don't have uh, credit history. Um, there's often discrimination in the banks and things like that. And so 
uh, that's just four. I think there's probably three others that you can think of hmm. um, where you just, you, you know, cultural integration and not knowing kind of the norms, not having any networks and communities. Uh, but yet, uh, refugees are 1.5 to 2x more entrepreneurial than native-born citizens. And so part of that is um, cross-cultural advantage. So like with Melek, she had a kind of a Syrian flair to her art that mm. when she goes to Jordan, they find to be exciting. Obviously, we, we see that kind of cross-cultural advantage in a lot of things. Um, one entrepreneur I really like is Razan. Uh, she started Yorkshire Cheese Company, Yorkshire Dama Cheese Company in um, in the UK, and it was hard writing about this because I hate cheese more than anything. <laughs> but um, but she won the World Cheese Award wow. uh, in the UK, and she like basically created, which honestly it's hard for me to even say without choking up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but no, it's actually a very beautiful thing. So basically, she um, she <laughs> fled Syria. She had many degrees, um, and she talks very candidly about how it, you know she said it, I think it is like being stabbed in the heart. The fact that she kept getting rejected and rejected yeah. and rejected. And she's like, I'm, you know, some of these folks are many years of school in uh, and some very like high up professionals who are not getting mm -hmm. any jobs. And so she ended up getting a 2,500 pound loan from oh. the UK government, which shows how little investment can make a big difference. Yeah. Uh, and she started Yorkshire Dama Cheese because she was able to see that the British milk was. Again, I'm out of my depth on this, but the, <laughs> the British milk was uh, well positioned, as she put it, to combine with making um, the kind of squeaky halloumi cheese mm. that is common in Syria. And so she started this company that went from 2,500 loan to 100K um, annually in revenue, winning awards, employing both refugees and net native born citizens. Mm. Um, so that's an example of cross cultural advantage, seeing something in the British resources, in the new ho home country's resources that maybe the people here won't see. Mm. Um, and then there's, uh, so that's one element. There's also uh, kind of an empathy and a, a desire to contribute to their new community. So yeah. um, Esma is a good example of that. Like she has kids and she knows the pain uh, of not having a community uh, and, and not having an education for kids. And so she basically, you know, being there was really amazing because she's, you know, these kids absolutely love her and hearing her tell the story, before it was like knocking on every trailer trying to get them to come, but the parents were resistant. They were like, hey, they're not going to school, but she kept pushing, and now it's like empowering kids in a way that um, is really beautiful. Uh, she tells the story of she had written a book, uh, she had um, done an assignment where folks were supposed to write whatever, you draw whatever was in their hearts, and everybody drew, with the exception of one girl who became her apprentice, uh, drew tanks, guns, like this is all a kid knows because they just were mm -hmm. in a middle of a war and that's where they were born, which is completely unjust and unfair. Um, but then by the end or by a year in, they were drawing kind of beautiful drawings, mm -hmm. that more color, more aspirational. Uh, and that's thanks to Esma and, and the parents in, in the community. Um, and so she has an, a level of empathy and a lot of people we see in the US, it's a desire to integrate in this new home community. And so mm -hmm. they, they'll build things that have a lot of empathy for their customer. Uh, the other thing is um, the kind of holy grail, you might say, of entrepreneurship is basically commitment, resilience, and risk-taking. Mm. And those three are probably the top things you can see in refugees. So yeah. resilience, um, you know, folks who have dealt with the, the worst possible thing uh, but have gone through it. Uh, commitment, you know, they have to go all in a lot of times. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I feel like I have backup options. A lot of refugees when they, they and, and immigrants more broadly, when they come to the U.S., this is, they have to do this for their family. And so there's a level of commitment. Uh, and then risk taking, um, you know, again, when you've sort of had to take the risk and flee your country, um, it's a little bit easier. Uh, it, it's a, it builds a kind of a toughness that yeah. uh, I think makes a big difference in entrepreneurship. And you see it. So basically, um, $63 billion uh, of net positive economic impact mm. on the United States economy in a 10 year period. That's after you count any kind of cost it took to resettle refugees. So it's basically an open and closed case on the impact they bring. Uh, and then, you know, 1.5 to 2x more entrepreneurial. Uh, I think 50 plus percent of unicorn companies, so billion dollar plus companies, are founded by at least one immigrant. 80% uh, are founded by um, folks who are immigrants or children of immigrants. Um, so it just keeps going on and on, both at the very highly valued companies and valued as in economically and the small businesses in our communities that make a difference. 
in every way. Um, and so, you know, but the last thing I'll say, and this goes to your last question, is I also wanted to make sure not to say in the book, refugees bring so much economic value, we should resettle them. That's part, that's part two, really. Yeah. <laughs> part one to me is it's a moral reason. Like, these are people who, for no fault of their own, have fled their country, lived normal lives, and then were completely disrupted because our global system failed them in some way, whether it be allowing the war to occur or not having a refugee resettlement system that functions mm -hmm. with less than 1% of refugees being formally resettled every year. Um, so we, it is our moral imperative to welcome them because they're fundamentally equal human beings mm -hmm. who deserve to be treated with dignity. Um, also, it's an, you know, if you're a policymaker, I feel like the, the Venn diagram of like what you should do is like moral and economic is like if you if something's in both, you know you should probably do it. <laughs> but uh, in this case, like it's it's in both, but it's not being done, and it's it's kind of a problem, yeah. very big a problem. Yeah, uh, this is a bit off script, but like, why do you think it's not being done? Like, if the incentives are aligned. Yeah, I think you know this is where I guess where I started caring a lot about storytelling is yeah. I think I really do believe the narrative affects voter preferences and it fa affects what politicians do with their, with their mm -hmm. lives and with their, their decisions. So again, this is really not a left or right issue in my opinion because you're seeing very much of the same stuff from the previous administration yeah. which decimated the refugee resettlement regime being done by the current uh, administration. It's not as extreme and there are actions being taken to in, in, increase the refugee resettlement but it hasn't really happened yet very much. So uh, for me, it's not a political thing um, and what happens is on both sides, there's this pressure. Maybe it's because the news media uh, and because uh, we, you know, there hasn't been enough of an effort done to tell this full story of refugees as people that you should invest in and welcome because they will help and revive our communities. Um, and I think that's actually the number one issue for me. And then, uh, you know, because if, if this was turned on its head and you were to hear more stories about Utica, New York, where refugees completely revived a city that was on a downturn, mm. both population-wise and business-wise, if you heard more stories about Zatri, about, uh, about Jacksonville, about communities all over the country where refugees have changed things around, um, I think you would, see, you would have more of an understanding of what's actually happening, mm. which is that cities are actually fighting each other to welcome refugees. Like there's, there are certain cities have, who have understood this and petitioned the government and want the government to resettle refugees there. So it, I think on the ground we see it, but to your point, I think this political cloud of buzzwords where you hear refugee and you're told to go to your mm. side of the aisle yeah. is completely messed up. And then even both sides of the aisle don't view people as fully human and admirable and, and respected. And so I think if we could shift the narrative, I think that's step one. I think step two is, um, you know, is is not having the regime in place to invest in entrepreneur in, in refugees properly, whether they're entrepreneurs or not, such that you start to see that economic return more quickly. Um, you know, and having the political will to say, actually, this is why, like many mayors have done, like this is actually going to change our community. Let's put some upfront capital so that if the returns happen even more quickly. Um, and there's, of course, there's also like discrimination on the ground as well. Yeah. And I don't want to downplay that, but I do think there's more unity on the ground than it seems. And it's more of like a narrative shift that's causing people to run to their political sides. Yeah. And both of which kind of don't love refugees. Similar, like, uh, there's a lot of groups, I think, that, that get fallen into this category where they're dehumanized by both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we open up to Q&A, yeah. uh, I wanted to end with a question about action. Yeah. So when people read your book um, and feel inspired, what do you hope they do with that inspiration? Yeah, thank you for asking. I think there's many things you can do depending on kind of your situation. Um, the clinic, of course, uh, here is like a perfect example. So if you're a law student or, or not a law student, I'm sure they're welcoming volunteers in different ways, translating, whatever it may be. So I think that's like a great, especially um, for those who are law students in the audience, like what an incredible privilege to be able to represent people. Um, uh, you all probably know well, but 50% of uh, folks who are facing deportation who have representation are able to stay. 10% who do not have representation are able to stay. So it's obviously uh, kind of a messed up system. Um, and so having folks who can represent and ensure that children, for example, aren't trying to represent themselves in a complicated 
legal proceeding, uh, which is kind of a basic due, due process right, um, occurs. Uh, I think the other thing is if you have like a, a organization that you're part of, whether it's your business, uh, your faith community, um, mobilizing resources to ensure that um, like the local resettlement centers have funding. So these are very underfunded resources and some really amazing people who are doing great work. Um, so you know, if you have the ability to fund or, or donate, that would be incredible. If you, um, if you don't, kind of mobilize your organization to do so. Um, another thing is like there's also just a very personal element. Like um, one of my uh, people who reached out to me about the book said that they were moved by it, um, uh, particularly like as a Christian who believes that um, we should welcome strangers, as the Apostle Paul says. Um, and she welcomed in a couple Ukrainian refugees mm -hmm. into her house. So if you have the resources to do that, there are very tactical things you can do. Again, just reach out to local YMCA, New Welcoming Center, you know, Catholic Resettlement Services, or uh, Catholic Services, and all those um, that you can reach out to. Uh, and then um, the other thing is, I think, uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that, but there's like a few. Uh, there's also ways to lend to immigrant and refugee-led businesses. Um, and I think the other thing is just narrative storytelling, so correcting folks uh, if, they, if they kind of fall into these different tropes. Awesome. Thank you so much for yeah. uh, <laughs> these questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have time for I think four or five questions. Um, you can just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Hi, I'm Ali Busio. I actually listened to your book. It's great. It's very oh. moving. It's awesome. I have two questions. One is, um, you only highlight women. I assume they're not only women entrepreneurs. I was just wondering uh, why you made that decision. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, the book is read by a woman. So I'm mm -hmm. actually surprised to, to see a man here. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I don't know why I just assumed. And so, I, so my second question is, why, why did you choose to have it read by a woman? So yeah, my two questions. absolutely, yeah. Um, First of all, I think if I read it, it would have been a disaster. So that's that's one that's <laughs> that's one element. Um, no, that was it was read by Helene Maxud, who's um, a really awesome actor. I don't know if y'all have seen. Um, she's been she was in industry recently, so that's cool. Uh, and she's um, Lebanese American or Lebanese British Canadian, I think. Uh, but uh, so in terms of the first question, um, essentially uh, the way I kind of thought about it is I didn't come in with any particular profile of person that I would want to feature. I actually wasn't even necessarily going to feature one or two or three people heavily. It was going to be more broad. Um, and many of the entrepreneurs I talk about are, are men. Um, but when I went to the Zetri camp, um, thanks to Save the Children Jordan, partnership with them, um, these were kind of the three stories that stood out to me the most. I think there's also an element, too, of um, they face even more obstacles, obviously. And so, um, you know, just the, the fact that they were able to create this kind of work and this kind of beauty um, with all of the battles that refugees face plus kind of gender discrimination and um, gender roles and things like that, I think was even more inspiring. Perhaps that's why they, they stood out, partly why they stood out. I also just became close with um, uh, two, of, two of the three, one I haven't um, spoken to in a while. Um, so there's an element of that too. And I kind of felt comfortable with them and they shared a lot. Um, and then uh, the other question related to uh, the, uh, the uh, yeah, I think the other part is just representation on the point of like um, the audiobook being read by a woman. I think, uh, again, like I, I felt like the more representation we can have, uh, the better. Um, and, you know, knowing my limitations as a man writing the book, I kind of wanted to uh, have as many um, amazing kind of women writers, leaders kind of put their voices in, um, and um, yeah, and Helene also was able to speak the Arabic much better than I could, which I thought was also important, is putting that Arabic in there um, as a, like a Middle East and North Africa representation in Africa more broadly. Um, so yeah, that's kind of. Correct me if I'm wrong, that these stories of entrepreneurship really, really differ from the case 
because you study in business school. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, I was wondering what your thoughts are on changing the two studies and how we teach in big fancy institutions to focus on what things like entrepreneurship mean on a more human level. Yes, yes, very, very good point. Um, also on that last point, I also again want to shout out my mom for translating. So another incredibly uh, amazing woman who contributed. Um, hi, mom. Um, <laughs> uh, on, the, uh, on the point about this, yeah, this is something I've thought about a lot about recently um, because, you know, I actually started writing it while in law school, uh, but then in business school it was very interesting to, you know, also my work focuses on supporting uh, underrepresented entrepreneurs, and so we'll be helping, like, get a loan for friends who runs a um, Haitian coffee shop in Orlando for, like, $15,000 zero interest loan, which makes a massive difference in his business. And then I'll be like on our Slack channel, and it's like, you know, people are talking about investments in millions of dollars just for an idea. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, I think it's like what, what these three folks, Esma, Malik, Yasmina, and so many others in the book represent is a, a kind of entrepreneurship that is um, almost like a different value system, like mm. it was not about them almost at all. Like I asked uh, Yasmina, you know, I tried to get more into the businesses side of it, like Yasmina, like, you know, you started this wedding shop pretty early, there's a few others in the camp, like how do you view competition? Which is a classic kind of business school case question. And she said, you know, God will take care of all of us like the way that we should, something to that effect. And so it's just a much more others-centered view of entrepreneurship that I found to be like very, very inspiring and a very good reminder of what entrepreneurship to me at, at its core is, which is having these you know, given abilities, God-given abilities or abilities that you have and expressing them in a way that is sustainable financially but also makes a big difference in the community. Um, and so um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, um, unfortunately, like the VC investment dollars are, if you look at the statistics, like very poorly distributed. Um, and so. It's even worse with uh, you know, people of color, with women. Uh, with women of color, it's dramatically bad. And then uh, with refugees, I haven't seen a stat, but I would assume it's very small. Um, and so uh, th this element, and then even within immigrants, it's like biased towards certain groups of immigrants. And so um, the other thing I would say is like putting both kind of loan and small business capital, but also like VC capital into immigrants and refugees would be quite valuable because again, we talked about the unicorn statistics and things like that. But overall, I, I think the main kind of distinction I'd say is like we, you know, in business school, I think we could learn a lot more at Stanford or Harvard Business School from Malik, Yasmin, and Esma than we could from these founders that are on the cover of Forbes. I guess we've been seeing that recently. Like every cover of Forbes ends up being somebody who's in jail at some point. Uh, I think if Esma was on the cover of that magazine, I think maybe we would have a more fruitful discussion about entrepreneurship and maybe we have better role models um, than uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for being here and for uh, writing this wonderful book. My question is into the creative uh, process behind writing this book. What do you think the idea that you had before you started writing the book and how you wanted the book to be uh, to shape up as differed from what it is now? And did that idea get altered while you were um, in the camp and you were mm -hmm. talking to these women? Yeah, thank you. I think um, I initially was going to make it a little more US centered. So I, I visited Utica, New York for a while. Uh, and I was thinking that might be the main location. Um, uh, partly because uh, it's, it has a really amazing kind of story where it was like on pace to be one of the most populated cities. Um, things were going kind of great economically and then the factory closures led to a downturn and then refugees from 40 plus countries came and kind of revived the city in a lot of ways. And I still talk a lot about Utica. Um, so I think one difference is having visited Zetri and being able to visit, thankfully, um, it's kind of tough to get in. So say the Children Jordan helping me visit and. and uh, coordinating, meeting different people like Asma, Malik, Yasmina, Aman, um, led me to just sort of be very inspired by their stories. I also um, wanted to be sensitive to their stories and how they wanted to present it. So the fact that I was able to build like solid relationships with them 
was also important to me because then I could kind of, again, share the book with Malek, um, things like that. Um, and then I think the other part is I, I kept grappling between, do, is this like a business book or is it a narrative nonfiction book? Um, and again, I kept going back to like my deepest belief or one of my deep, deepest beliefs um, is that people want to be united uh, and it's just a matter of telling a human story about people who are otherized and then if you can get that human story and realize, okay, this person is no different than me, except they dealt with the worst thing I can imagine. Um, and this is a person with equal dignity, creativity, power, and beauty. Uh, then you can start talking about the policy. And so I ended up going with that route. Um, it's mostly narrative nonfiction. And then every other, every three or four chapters, it takes a bit of a step back and talks about the policy. So that was something uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to land on. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Hey, uh, Andrew was my college roommate actually <laughs> at Duke about ten years ago. Yeah. Um, so I know you know personally that you've been interested in doing this kind of work for quite a while. Uh, but I would like to know you know how did this process change your outlook or help you grow as a person, and, and what did you learn from start to finish? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit like shook that you just said roommate and not best friend, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Um, what did I learn uh, going through it? I think um, I think when you really dwell on um, what it takes to uh, have left a country, specifically being forced out uh, and finding a completely new life, um, it made me admire my parents even more. And again, my parents weren't refugees, they were immigrants, and so they were able to kind of on their own accord leave. But you know, my dad you know, came to the U, you know my dad's story a bit, uh, came to the US with very little money, uh, and uh, through the UK, came to the UK with very little money, did extra training, uh, became a doctor in the US, uh, changed the lives of thousands of people in Jacksonville as a primary care physician with his own practice, wrote a book on healthcare, um, you know, my mom influenced the lives of, you know, th hundreds, thousands of children in Jacksonville as an incredible teacher. And so the ability to like, you know, it, I just think back to how complicated everything is <laughs> in life, like taxes, uh, you know, uh, you know, like you get confusing letters in the mail all the time. Like thinking about, uh, and for those who are immigrants in the audience, like you, let's give a round of applause <laughs> because, I mean, to be able to like, I went to Harvard Law School. <laughs> I can't figure out most of this stuff. So it's like my, you know, my dad starting a whole business and like, you know, figuring that out. I think is pretty inspiring. And so, you know, talking to Esma Malik, Ismina, Aman, um, Razan, uh, so many others, you you just get more of appreciation for it because it's like you really started often with nothing, and um, you know, you were often like, it's a big just uh, strange juxtaposition because you were kind of like living a, in many times, many cases, a very comfortable life, and now you're not, and you're kind of thrown into the deep end. Um, and so, yeah, just greater respect for my family's history and um, so many others. Uh, <laughs> One more, okay. Let's go. We're going to be here till. let's keep going. I didn't mean that. I actually meant, please do ask questions. I didn't mean that sarcastically. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for being here again. Um, with your business background, I'm just curious. You kind of mentioned the whole Venn diagram, how things that are, you know, it, it's, it makes moral, <clears throat> moral and economic sense yeah. <clears throat> to do certain things. Um, you know, with the rise of impact investing and ESG and all these non-financial beneficial um, kind of impacts that a lot of investments have, Mm -hmm. What do you think is kind of like a systemic change, you know, in the investment landscape to, to, to be able to kind of allocate these dollars to, to, to areas like, you know, like these that are kind of not receiving the right, the right attention, um, yeah. you know, to, to kind of impact um, entrepreneurs like this and, and, and still kind of, you know, you mentioned that VC dollars are under allocated to this area. So what kind of things do you see as kind of like high level things that could be changed in order to kind of, you know, have these you know, it funds, pay more attention to these areas? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there is uh, one group that's doing, uh, the Refugee Investment Network is an organization that's working to 
they've created like a at least an academic framework to begin that discussion of what does it mean to make an investment that supports refugees like you're, you're investing in the refugee entrepreneur but there's also levels of investing in companies that um, will hire refugees commit to hiring refugees things like that um, for me I think um, I think that's a great start I think um, I think there's a few things so start moving away from VC quickly briefly like I think at the small business level um, it's far too difficult systemically for refugees to get loans and so this reliance on kind of credit history I would try to move away uh, from because they don't have a credit history and so th that's an issue uh, I think the more kind of zero interest loan programs that exist the better and so you know if I were in the federal government, Kiva, for example, it's, it does a lot internationally, but it also does zero interest loans in the US, and it's who we partner with, with my organization, DreamX America. I would invest a lot in that, because zero interest loan is the most simple, straightforward way to help somebody get off the ground. Um, the other thing I would say, on, again, on the small business level is, uh, one, one of my ventures, Mona, works on how do we invest in their products earlier, and so I think there's an like a high level element of sourcing, so like if you're Microsoft or you're a major company, what are you doing at every sourcing level to consider underrepresented small businesses? Um, and you know, so we work on corporate gifting, for example. Like, rather than just getting the same water bottle for your company ten times, like, can you support uh, a small business while getting a way better product, anyways? Um, so there's kind of where those big dollars are for corporations are spending for services and products. How do you funnel that into the small businesses um, and zero interest loans, and then? Um, and then I think on the VC level, um, yeah, I, I think for that, there's a lot of issues. So I think one is the decision makers are quite homogenous. Um, and so I think for that, uh, part of it is making business school less expensive and not having to take hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans um, in order to be able to get into a position where maybe a VC firm would hire you. Um, I think VC firms themselves need to do a real thought process about, again, the Venn diagram and like, are we ignoring groups because of biases that we have uh, about what a refugee is and what an immigrant is or what types of immigrants might lead to high returns? Um, and then I think we're seeing some funds specifically focus on immigrants, uh, like one-way ventures and things like that, I think here in Boston. I think um, those are helpful, but I, I think like the major ones need to look in the mirror and say, are like, it's, it's not okay to just move from 2% black women to 3% black women. Um, and looking at every step of the sourcing and saying, maybe we need to not just look at Harvard and Yale and Stanford. Maybe we need to have more partners who are um, people of color. Like maybe we need to, you know, and these are basic things, but, uh, you know, unfortunately they're not acting on them very quickly. So I'd say that's another element. I also think government investment is like very important. So like the government investing in resettlement programs and not just, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, we cut the budget over the last few years, the new administration needs to like triple down and say there's a huge ROI on this. And if every immigrant in every city around the country and refugee could go to their local center and be provided a loan through Kiva or whatever it is and be provided everything they need to get started, I think we would see it be humane and it would be economically yeah, it's a great question. Awesome. Let's have thank one last round of applause for yes, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Let's give it up. Thank you so much. And stop by the book table to get a, your copy so you can get it signed. <laughs>